Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today's scripture reading is 1 Corinthians, verse 1 through 13, and it can be found on the overhead screen behind me. Let us pray. <coughs> Loving God, you provide for our every need. You feed our bodies and our souls. Yet we hunger to know and love you more and more. Nourish us with your word today, through Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit we pray. Amen. Amen. Hear the word of God, the gift of love. If I speak in tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith, so as to remove the mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient, love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends, but as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to, my, to the childish ways. For now we see in a mirror, dimly. But when we will, face, we will see face to face, now I know only in part. Then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide. These things three, and the greatest of love of these is love. The word of the Lord. Many of you know that I was born and raised a proud hillbilly from West by God, Virginia. <laughs> And on December 22nd, this very young hillbilly as a child knew that Christmas was only three days away. And Christmas would be celebrated at my maternal mother's parents' home, my grandparents' home, Mama and Papa, in good Appalachian slang. And on December 22nd, I knew that it was about the time where I would be asked to go downstairs to retrieve the punch bowl. Now, this three bedroom, one bath home was pretty modest when they built it with their hands in 1957, but to a young child, it was a mansion, except when you had to go downstairs into the cellar. And if some of you remember these light switches, right? The basement is unfinished, and it's dark, and it's damp, and it's cold. And the light fixture is not a switch, right? It's one of those things that's just connected to the light socket, to the wiring, with a very short drawstring to switch the light on. Some shaking heads, right? And as an adult, it is easy for us to grab these things, right? But for a 10-year-old child who's expecting to get the punch bowl, this is a very frightening task. As a child, I was afraid of the dark. So, with some trepidation and a little bit of courage, I would open the basement door and slowly descend down the steps, praying that God would help me retrieve the punch bowl with the dim light coming down the steps. And for a good eight years or so, I would make it to the bottom of the steps and my imagination would get the best of me. And all of the dragons and monsters in the corners, they would get ready to come out and jump on me and I would run up the stairs trying my best not to trip. And I would run into my papa and I would say, Papa, I'm afraid. Will you help me? 
and you would look me in the eye and say, Kevin, there is nothing to fear. Let me go with you to show you the way. I love my God. Eleven years ago, on this day, he went to be with Jesus. And not only do did I love my papa, past tense, I loved my papa today. Because not just in those moments when I was afraid, he was there with me to show me the way through life. And I believe that the love I have for Papa, a love that is not too dissimilar to very, very special people in your own life, this love that I reflect upon, this love that you may be reflecting upon this Christmas season, is a reflection of the infinite love that we find in our Lord Jesus Christ. As we journey through this Advent season, preparing our hearts so that we can celebrate with the fullness of ourselves the depth of the meaning of Christmas, we've been focusing on some themes to help us prepare. Hope, peace, joy, and today I want us to focus on this concept of infinite love that we find in the Christmas season of our Lord Jesus. But as we prepare to do that, I don't want us to get lost in the sentimentality of the season. Because at times we live in a very dark and fearful world. Just this past week, our nation observed its third ever impeachment of a sitting president. And I got a message this week. In light of an evangelical magazine coming out with a side in the impeachment debate, and the message said, Pastor Kevin, do you support impeachment or not? Boy, I was entering a dark basement at that moment. <laughs> But we do live in a dark and fearful world, don't we? We live in a dark and fearful world where we are becoming afraid of one another. Where the Republicans are afraid of the Democrats, and the Democrats are afraid of the Republicans. Especially amongst children and youth, there is a growing fear of the reality and uh, the consequences of climate change and what that will mean for our children. I have relatives in West Virginia who say, but if we take steps to decrease coal, you will take away my livelihood. And I am fearful for how I will feed my children if our nation takes steps to reduce coal output, not to mention the rest of the economic realities of our decisions as a culture in the climate change debate. I believe that as a culture, we are afraid to have open and honest and caring conversations about race relations in our country. We are afraid. Often we're afraid for our children and the future in which they will grow up. And we have the very human realities of the fearness of disease and the reality of our own death. Friends, uh, in light of infinite love, we continue to live in a dark and fearful world where you don't need a preacher to tell you that. I do believe that this manifestation of fear in this culture that often perpetuates profits and materialism and politics, this fear is the result of a people that have lost its security in the sense of transcendence. We have turned our hearts away from Jesus and found our security in the princes of the world. We have found our securities in the balances of our bank accounts. And this fear is only a symptom of a larger disease of a people who are looking for love, security, and peace in all the wrong places. In response to this question, oh, Kevin, do you support impeachment or not? And prayed about how to respond. And I said, in this Christmas season, I support Jesus. I support hope. I support 
peace, I support joy, I support love, and it is the task of the church, I believe, not to be the center of this political debate between the left and the right. Our task is to continue to point people to Jesus and vote as such, right? Because wouldn't we live in a better land if all of our politicians in Washington weren't concerned about party, but were more concerned about Jesus? Can I get an amen? Amen. Right. So Rich Viotis, who is a pastor in New York, writes this about the goal of the church and this fearful political reality. He says, the church is not to be found in the center of the left and right. It is not my job to say, oh, let's find a nice, wonderful way in the center. Rather, the church is to be a species of its own kind, confounding both the left and right and finding its identity from the center of God's life. Friends, we don't report to Trump, we don't report to Pelosi, but our identity is found in Jesus Christ. And as Christians, we do best to point people to Jesus in a dark and fearful world. So what is this center of God's life? And this brings us to our reading from 1 John chapter 4, verse 7 through 21. Listen again for the word of the Lord. John writes, Beloved, let us love one another because love is from God. Everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God, for God is love. God's love was revealed among us in this way. God sent his only son into the world so that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Beloved, since God loved us so much, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this, we know that we abide in him, and he in us, because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and do testify that the Father has sent his Son as the Savior of the world. God abides in those who confess that Jesus is the Son of God, and they abide in God. So we have known and believed the love that God has for us. God is love. And those who abide in love abide in God, and God abides in them. Love has been perfected among us in this, that we have, may have boldness on the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment. And whoever fears has not reached perfection in love. We love because he first loved us. Listen to this. This is good. Those who say, I love God and hate their brothers and sisters, they are liars. For those who do not love a brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this. Those who love God must love their brothers and sisters also. Sisters and brothers, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Well, for the applause for the Bible. We are happy to clap today. It is good to clap. I wish Christians would take these words seriously, right? But I want to share with you um, these words about love. As I was at summer camp, chasing beautiful women when I was 19 years old, and I found one, right? <laughs> but I was in a Christian community, not really because I was there to find Jesus, but God works in crazy ways, right? I'm, I'm reading this scripture passage after weeks of intentional Christian community. And it fell on me like a ton of bricks. This is the reality that I have felt at different places and times in my life. That God is love. 
and that feeling that I experienced with my grandpa, those feelings with your loved ones, right? These are a reflection of something much greater and trans far more transcendent than we can imagine. These powerful, ineffable experiences that we have in our lives, and sometimes we can count on two hands, right? These experiences come from God, who is not like love, but God is love. These are the words that brought me to Christianity. Because God is love. There at that Christian camp, I realized the source of Papo's love for me and my love for him. I realized the power of friends at Camp Crestfield, who to this day, I believe, would take a bullet for me because they love me, and I hope that I would do the same for them because I love them. This power of love that we experience at the birth of our children or in our wedding days, or where we're sitting beside uh, our loved one in a hospital bed, holding their hand, preparing them on the way to meet Jesus. These overwhelming, sometimes painful experiences of love. These are the things that matter in life because they are grounded in the triune God. So as we focus on infinite love in a dark and fearful world, I want us to tease out some perspectives that we can realize about love in our lives that point us to Jesus. The first is this. Love finds its source, its only source, in the triune God. As Christians, we're Trinitarians, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's a full graduate education work of uh, education to understand or not understand the Trinity, right? But basically, we believe that the triune God is love. The Father loves the Son, who loves the Spirit, and it's infinitely intertwined. And out of love, the triune God creates, because God loves to love. And the, uniform, the universe is spoken into creation. Scientists tell us it's like some 14 billion years old because God loves. And if you look at the photos from NASA, it's an incredibly expansive and beautiful universe. And God wasn't finished. Somehow in God's providence, you came along, not because of chance, but because of love. And this whole creation, God longs for our love in return. We don't always get it right. So God becomes one of us because God loves us so much to teach us the ways. And I share this in the confession week after week. God loves us so much that even while we kill Jesus, God continues to love us in the death and resurrection of Jesus and offers us the real source of love in Jesus. The biblical perspective of these feelings that you feel for your loved ones, for your friends, that finds its source in God, who is the primary source. The second perspective we find in the Bible about love is that perfect love casts out all fear. Now, my grandfather's love was not perfect, right? But as I would run up the steps to him, I was comforted. Those imaginary monsters in the basement would dare not come out when Papa was with me down in the basement. But perfect love casts out all the fear where we can live with boldness. And sometimes a dark and fearful world, we don't need to be afraid because we know the source of love and we know who we are returning to and we know the power of hell cannot snatch us away from God's love. And the third point that I want to share with us as we ponder infinite love is kind of a gut check for all of us. That if we say we love God, but we don't love our neighbor, our brother or sister, we're a liar. Now, it's easy to point to other people and say, oh, that person doesn't love God, that person doesn't love God, yet they're in church on Sunday, every Sunday morning, what a bunch of hypocrites, right? But I want us to look inward, and I want you to think of those others in your life, those other poor people, or those other rich people, or those terrible people of the opposing political party, those other people. If we say we love God, 
but we don't love our neighbor, God says you are a liar. Gut check for all of this, for all of us. So how can we know? How can we know if we are practicing love in our life? And I'm grateful that Bounds read it. I'm grateful that Jamie read it. We can look to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. The definition of love from a biblical perspective. And we can read what love is. Not just to those we love, but to those who are our enemies. Love is patient, love is kind. And I love this trick. I forget where I learned it. But if you want to figure out if you're loving yourself or your family or your neighbor, just remove the word love. Love is patient, love is kind. And insert your own first name. Kevin is patient. Kevin is kind. And you can read through that on your own. But I have very strong suspicions that as you look upon the list, that you realize that you need Jesus' help in perfecting this love within you. Because Lord knows I need Jesus' help. But I want to share with you, I was with a person yesterday who passes this litmus test on a very wonderful scale. Some of you know my friend, our friend, Hank Orkman. Uh, and Hank Ortman is enjoying an unanticipated, unscheduled vacation at Hotel de la St. Luke's downtown. <laughs> and I asked permission of Hank to share the conversation and news. Uh, some of you know that Hank has been diagnosed with uh, liver and pancreatic cancer. And already we were looking at months, not weeks, not years, we're looking at months. And he goes in for an MRI uh, just this past week and learns that the cancer has spread to his brain. So he is right at this moment, chilling out downtown. His lovely wife Lois is here, and I'm grateful that he gave permission for me to share this with you. But we're talking about love. In life, and I say, Hank, hey, what is it like? Knowing that the end is not very close, but it is not very far away. What's it like looking back? And here's what we talked about we didn't talk about impeachment, we didn't talk about the politics of the committees here at the church. We talked about Lois, we talked about his grandchildren talked about the legacy he will leave. He talked about you. And he has a pretty intensive round of radiation because Hank's playing hardball the next few weeks with the doctors who are supportive of this decision. Um, then he goes, Pastor, I don't have radiation on Christmas Eve. I'm gonna ask my doctors if I can go to church Christmas Eve night because I love my family. Friends, these are the things that are most real. And in God's kingdom, the only things that have ever mattered is this concept of infinite love in your life. Hank has these things from 1 Corinthians down pretty well. We won't ask Lois because, you know, marriages are not always perfect, right? <laughs> But as we know Hank, he's really good at this. He's nurturing love. So when we think about our own mortality, the inevitable, we will transition to the next kingdom. Would you like to possess this love that Hank has? This no fear of what is to come because he knows his Lord Jesus? I know I would. That's why I talked so much with him yesterday. But as I crafted this sermon afterward, if we want to nurture this notion of infinite love, which finds its source in God and which leads us to God, here's what we can do. We can return to Jesus, who is the source of all of that which is good and beautiful and true. And you've heard me say this every Sunday in Advent. 
But friends, if you want to discover the depths of your God-given self, we believe that we can only truly find that as we discover ourselves in the author of reality, Jesus Christ. The second thing that we can do is love our neighbor. Sometimes this is really hard to do, right? But as we give of ourselves, we realize that we gain so much in return. And this is what I really appreciated about my visit with teacher Hank yesterday. He says, as I have grown older, I have realized the value of forgiveness in my life. So if there is someone in your life, I encourage you this Christmas season to find forgiveness in your heart because we find our own forgiveness in Jesus, who calls us to be those peacemakers in the world. And this is really concrete. It's the last point of how we can nurture this. But celebrate Christmas in your home. Tell the story to your children about why we celebrate Christmas. On Christmas Eve, don't make it an afterthought to come to worship. Make it a priority teaching your family that Jesus is the reason. Jesus is the reason why we are here and gives us hope to live in a dark and fearful world. Consider your own prayer life, your devotional life, your commitment to the church, and not just Covenant Presbyterian Church, though I would appreciate that, but more importantly, your commitment to the church of Jesus Christ, because I cross my heart that is the person in whom you will find eternal and abundant life. There is an ancient legend that is told about God. And God is getting frustrated with humanity's tendency to steer away from love and to pursue fear and to pursue darkness. So God calls all of his angels together and says, we need to compile all the wisdom of humanity and the world and create a place where people can seek out my love for them so they will find me. So the angels get to work and they develop an incredible library that is beautiful, that permeates the skyline. All the leaflets of the pages are bound with gold leaf, but it's almost intimidating for the people to step into. God says, this won't work. We need to make this more simple. So the editors of the angels get together and they take all of the wisdom and they put it together in one single large encyclopedia that can be handed from one person to another and easily reproduced. But even then God says, this is too much. We need to create a pamphlet. So the angels get together and they create a threefold, beautiful, glossy paper pamphlet about the ways that we find and experience God in our lives and live to our true potential. But God, realizing humanity's laziness, realizing our illiteracy, says we need to make this even more simple. We need to make this one word of how people will discover and what is the word? Love. If you find your own self in the basement of fear this holiday season, why don't you run to the one who will look you in the eye and say, do not fear, for I am with you, and I will show you the way. The one who in the person of Jesus says, I love you with an infinite love. Let us pray. Almighty God, forgive us when we do not love. Lord, help us to be your people. People of love, a people of integrity, a people of truth. And in this fearful world, let us run to you, for you are the light. And in your boldness, you tell us that we are the light too. So Lord, help our light shine as we love the world the way that you have loved us. 
Help us to nurture this sense of infinite love so that we live lives not of fear, but of overflowing, incredible, amazing grace, of wonderful love. We all pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.